So Bill has been talking about water quality in terms of temperature. He'll be talking about water quality in terms of nutrients and sediment export this afternoon, or actually in the next talk. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to talk about water quantity. Um, and I actually have two different messages in this talk. The first one is for the policy folk here. Um, what we saw was what we expected. Total yield on a per area basis increased following harvest. So if you cut down the vegetation, remove the vegetation, you decrease evapotranspiration, more water runs off. Um, the more harvest, the bigger percentage of the basin that you harvest, uh, the more water runs off. Um, we also saw a change that varied with the buffer treatments. Uh, again, to be expected, we have vegetation left down in the riparian area. We increase light to it, um, and that vegetation can take up some of that water. Um, and finally, we saw a seasonal variability in the response. And that second, or that third piece, actually leads me to what I'm going to focus on for a lot of my talk, which is really for the scientists out there, um, which is that ANOVA, analysis of variance, isn't probably the most appropriate way to look at this sort of data. Um, and I'll make a case for that. And it isn't my own idea. It really stems from a 2009 paper by a guy named Aaliyah. Uh, Forests and Floods, a New Paradigm Sheds Light on Age-Old Controversies, in which he introduces this idea of a frequency analysis that I'm going to show you here. So just a quick background. <coughs> um, Bill installed flumes. So Bill actually did all the data collection for this project. I actually didn't, I didn't do <laughs> any of the data collection uh, for anything I'm going to talk about today. Um, installed the uh, flumes out in six of the basins. Two of the basins didn't have good flume sites, so he put out um, stage recorders associated with culverts and then developed his own stage discharge relationship uh, for those basins. The flumes have built-in stage discharge relationships for them. The stage data was collected at 10-minute intervals, turned into discharge, and then I averaged those up to daily values for, for what I'm going to present. And as Bill mentioned, we use generalized least squares to deal with the lack of independence in the time series. So discharge is high one day. The likelihood of it being high the next day is pretty good. Um, those data are not independent. And most of our statical, statistical techniques are based around random data um, that's all independent. So we actually model in the, the time series using an autoregressive uh, model, um, autoregressive moving average, and uh, we end up with independent uh, errors. So we establish a pre-treatment um, relationship with the reference and treatment site. We use that relationship to predict what we would expect to see in the absence of a treatment in the treatment site. And then we compare what we observed against what we expected to see. Um, and so in the graphs I'll show, the, the time, the year effect is already incorporated. So uh, Bill already talked about stationarity. We, we assume that. Um, all our data leads us to believe the stationarity is good. Um, and so we don't have to worry about year effects, uh, weather. That's already incorporated. So if it was a wetter year later, um, it's, it's incorporated here. And what we see in our results, as we expected to see, so the Olympic block is on the left, the Wilpa 1 block on the right. These are our two complete blocks. The 100% treatment is on the left, and uh, previous literature has shown that you have to cut up to about 40% of a basin before you start to see measurable discharge changes. And that's pretty much what we see here. Um, and that as we cut more of the basin and have less vegetation left in the riparian area, we get a bigger change in discharge. So the 100 percent actually, uh, and this is mean discharge. So this is that ANOVA analysis that um, we're used to looking at and used to doing. What we see is that the 100 percent basins actually had no change in mean discharge. Um, total yield went up slightly. So we got slightly more water in total out of the 100 percent basins. Um, but and yield increased as we moved from, from left to right. Um, and that in terms of the means, the 100% the weren't statistically significant. Um, the change was significant in, for the forest practice and the 0%, and they increased about 60% on average. So that's the basic result. Um, 
And I would like to ask whether the mean is actually really relevant to what we're interested in. I think if you're interested in something like body mass index, what the most likely body mass index is for an individual, the mean's great. If we're interested in things like floods or droughts, uh, temperatures, uh, maybe the mean isn't the best indice for us. And part of it is that the changes in the distribution affect the frequency of occurrence. So small shifts in magnitude can actually be expressed as big changes in recurrence. I just moved to Wenatchee last summer, and I found out it is really hot there in the summer. And I went to the climate conference up at UW and found out it's getting yet even hotter. And they said that the mean temperature might increase, you know, I don't know, five degrees, 70 to 75. And, and that doesn't bother me at all. Uh, that's fine. They also said the maximum's going to increase to like, you know, from 105 to, I don't know, 110 or something. And that scared me a little bit uh, because I don't like really hot temperatures. And once it gets above about 102, I seek shelter indoors. I just, I don't like hot temperatures. And so 105 to 110, it just means, you know, I'm going to be inside. <laughs> um, what really scared me is that they said the number of days when it's going to be above 102 is going to go from about a week each year to about three weeks or more each summer. And that's what bothers me because that's a stressor event for me. When it's that hot, I'm, I'm hiding out indoors. And to be hiding out for you know, a month, a year, uh, it's, it's a big deal. So this is one of the graphs from our report, and I'm actually going to spend a lot of the rest of my talk talking about this one graph. Um, and that's because all, we have this for, for a bunch of different um, uh, basins and treatments, but this is very illustrative of the, the, the issue with means versus the frequency distribution. And I want to take a little bit of time to explain this graph. So down here in this inset, we have discharge on the x-axis. And this is basically a histogram. It's a density graph. And what you see is the pre is shown here in red. And the post, after the treatment, is shown in blue. And you see that the central tendency of those two is very similar. Okay, We already know that. We saw that for the 100% basins, there was no real difference in the mean, not statistically significant difference. But the thing that stands out in this graph to me is that the variance has increased. So we have more days with low discharge and more days with higher discharge than we would have expected based on our pretreatment regressions. So now if I look at the bigger graph, I see that on the x-axis we have recurrence interval and in days. And we have discharge on the y-axis. Again, this is a log scale. So our maximum discharge is up here in the top right. The smallest discharge is over here on the left. And if we look at the lowest expected discharge in this basin for the two-year period, we would see that the, we wouldn't expect it to get below about 8 uh, cubic meters per hectare per day. And what we observed were discharges around four cubic meters per hectare per day. So the, the minimum discharge decreased. If we go up here to the max, uh, actually, it's not significant change here. Uh, it's not until you get out to about the 30-day event that we see that the blue line is significantly above the red line. These are 95% confidence intervals. So we see that for a period of time here, the discharge is higher than we would expect. If you go to the two-day recurrence interval, this has significance because that is the discharge we would expect to see every other day on average. And so it's the median, right? It's half the values are higher than the two-day, and half the values are less than the two-day. It's just sort of condensed the way I put this axis. I'm a geomorphologist. I tend to focus on floods. but. This is the, the central tendency. And in fact, you see it matches what we saw previously. Uh, there's no change in the mean, or median in this case, very little change. But for all the events less than the mean or median, we have less discharge. If you are a creature, I'm not a biologist, but um, if a biologist came to me and said, hey, 
we have some creature out there that gets really stressed out when the discharge gets less than 10 cubic uh, meters per hectare per day. You know, what's the effect of the treatment going to be on that creature? I would say, well, in the pre-treatment, we would have expected maybe two or three days when they would be stressed out by the fact that the flows are low. But in the post-treatment, we see that there are probably 40 days when the discharge is less than that. So you can read this graph in two, day, two ways. You can read it in an up-down fashion. What is the magnitude of change for any given recurrence interval, for the lowest, for the median, for the maximum? Or you can read it from left to right in terms of the time period that we would expect to see this change. And so, again, I'm a geomorphologist. I was focusing on kind of the flood events. We see no real change in the actual floods, peak flows. But what we do see is a shift for most of the events between the 30-day recurrence interval and the median. We see higher discharges than we would have expected. And we see that that affects the frequency. So for the 30-day event, it goes from happening about 12 times a year on average, to happening about 24 times a year. It goes from a 30-day recurrence interval to a 15-day recurrence interval. Again, if that's a stressor or if that is a sediment transporting event um, or whatever, that is potentially as meaningful the change in frequency as the change in magnitude. Okay? And I think that a lot of times we tend to, to not see these kinds of changes or not look for them. So this was a 15-minute talk, and I could spend a lot of time talking about the actual data for all the, all the treatments. Um, what I want you to know is that we did see significant changes in the frequency magnitude on all treatments. Uh, in general, the clear cuts had big changes in relative magnitude at, for low events, um, in contrast to the 100% treatment, which actually saw a decrease in discharge for those uh, frequent events. Um, and that we didn't see changes in the peak flows for anything. Uh, the 30-day event, you know, is again one that I focused on. We saw it double in frequency across pretty much all the treatments. So discharge is going to vary based on basin characteristics, uh, the amount of harvest, and where the remaining vegetation is. Uh, our results are consistent with that. Um, and I'm going to save questions until we do the panel. <laughs>